Okay, well, thank you so much for attending today for, I guess, one of these uh, last talks for um, for BlinkCon. And uh, I would like to first give a quick shout out to uh, Dan Sanders, who helped put this talk together. Uh, without him, it would not be complete, comprehensive, or comprehensible. So thank you very much, Dan. So the goal of today's talk is not to do a deep dive into what codec is, uh, web codec is, or how to use it. Um, instead, we're going to talk about some high-level design decisions that we have made along the way. Um, and hopefully, there's some learnings that you can take away from this in designing your own APIs. So what is web codecs? It is an API for efficient, low-level access to browser media codecs. The key takeaway here is that the codecs are already shipped uh, either via the browser or the platform that you're on, and we're just exposing them through this API. And also that this API allows developers access to raw media, which isn't something that is currently necessarily easy to do on the web right now. Um, what might you use web codecs for? Well, the canonical use case is to take a stream of frames from a camera, apply some filters on it, such as um, background blur or funny hats or whatever. And then you can encode those frames and then send them off to wherever, uh, maybe using web transports, for example. You can also use web codecs to replace existing WASM applications um, or WASM codecs. So you might want to do this because you don't have to download anything. It's already on the client, which means that it'll be faster for the load times. And also, you have access to hardware decoders and encoders. Um, here's just a quick blurb of what web codecs might look like. So we have an audio decoder that we initialize with an error callback and an output callback. We configure it. We give it a chunk to decode. And that's pretty much it. Now. There is obviously a lot more to this than web codecs, and the devil is in the details. But this is uh, probably what you need to know for this talk. So in its conception, web codecs was uh, originally a, a streams-based API. But we wrote a prototype, and we found that um, it, it didn't map as nicely as we would have liked it to be. Um, and there were some design edge cases. And uh, this was because our use of streams was complex because we had multiple different control signals. And uh, that made it hard to uh, synchronize with uh, the data signals, I mean, the data stream from um, actual frames. So an example of that is, well, if you have a configure signal that's out, out of band, um, what do you do with actual um, uh, what do you do with the fr the frames that you've already queued into your encoder when you reconfigure the encoder, that kind of stuff, or uh, the fact that our reset signal is meant to immediately drop all work, and so that kind of has to map to uh, aborting the stream, and resetting a codec is not fatal, but aborting a stream is, so that could propagate along your graph, and uh, that means you have to create a new stream and replumb it, uh, repipe the endpoints everywhere. And uh, yeah, so uh, we did not go with streams. And we did not go with promises either, because of the nature of promises. You create extra states for all the different pending promises that you have, and that creates extra complexity. So you could have edge cases such as a successful call to configure that would um, that would the promise would resolve, but then it would resolve right as a decode error would transition transition the codec into an error state, and um, yeah, so that forces the developers or the browser vendors to implement a bunch of extra checks about state coherence. It also forces eager evaluation. So an example of that would be that if you have your call to configure, sometimes you only know if it succeeds or not by actually spinning up a codec, applying the configuration, and checking if that succeeds. And 
if you didn't have a promise, you could maybe do something clever and delay that check to later until you have a first frame or whatever. But uh, in the case of a promise, you need the promise to actually resolve. So you're always forced to do that work now. So we went with callbacks. They are simple and um, their synchronous nature map well to the state transitions that we had. Um, yeah, and we'll have plenty of discussion in the Q&A to uh, talk about this. Um, so you might also wonder why does a modern web API force users to manage the lifetime of the resources? Well, it's because video frames keep hardware frames alive, or I mean, it could be software frame as well, but this is the issue came with hardware frames. And um, you might have only 10 hardware frames in your, in your buffer pool. And so that's not even a second's worth of video. And if it takes 15 seconds for the garbage collector to kick in and destroy your video frames, that's, that doesn't work. So uh, we force developers to close the frames when they're done with them. Uh, but that came along with its own set of issues. So, sorry. <laughs> um, so when posting a frame via post message, we ended up with a dangling reference that we uh, could not close. And um, I won't go into the detail of that dangling reference, but we got around it with using a, a handle, which I guess groups the lifetime of multiple video frames together. Um, and then also when working with transferable streams, transferable streams actually do not, um, you can transfer an endpoint, but you do not transfer the chunks themselves. You clone the chunks internally with a transferable stream. And so um, for our work with the breakout box API, we ended up with some problems leaking references on the producer side of things. So uh, as a workaround, we implemented the stream transfer optimization. And there was a talk yesterday by the streams team about it. So you can go back and listen to it. I think it is called streams and media. And uh, that allows us to send native frame references directly uh, on, on the native side instead of going through the, uh, to the, the streams pipeline. Um, but then also the stream steam allowed us to transfer stream items as opposed to clone them. Uh, but that only works for internal streams, uh, or rather um, stream endpoints that are not exposed to the web. Um, yeah. So I, uh, one thing that we learned in developing this API is that we probably should have worked behind a flag for longer. Uh, we pretty quickly went into an origin trial to get feedback. Um, and we could have gotten that feedback from our partners just from working behind a flag. But our ship date was pushed back twice. And that means we had to extend our origin trial. So yeah, I guess our recommendation is be uh, cautious when jumping in an origin trial, make sure that you have something that is uh, stable. And then um, there's plenty of problems left to solve with web codecs. Uh, one that would be very useful is if we had access to read-only memory on the web somehow. That would allow us to... Um, um, so we don't want JavaScript to modify the frames or the audio da data as it is being crunched by the codecs. So what we do instead is we snapshot that data, and instead of exposing direct access to it, we copy it back out. So that could be greatly improved if we had access to read-only memory that we could expose. Um, and then there's plenty of muxing and demuxing JavaScript libraries that are available, but it's not necessarily clear to developers which ones to use or how to use them. So um, we so there's talks of maybe introducing Web Containers API, which would be um, a complement to Web Codecs and will allow you to build the containers around uh, the chunks that you encode or decode. Um, now there's also talks of introducing some form of uh, API for pooling buffers. Internally, we definitely pool our frames and audio data, but this would be maybe for the, uh, the encoded chunks. And then there's also plenty of things that uh, Web Codex V1 does not address. 
Um, so things that will have to be addressed, such as like color space and all that, and those are ripe with um, interesting design opportunities. And with that, I am exactly at 10 minutes on my timer. Uh, and that leaves us plenty of time for Q&A. Does anybody have, um, I don't, are there any raised hands or questions in the chat? I didn't see any. Well, if I'm allowed a tiny bit more time, I'm just going to, oh, okay. Uh, yes, Jeremy. So um, you mentioned that like the origin trial, you started this origin trial and you're, you had to extend it in your conclusion was that you should have experimented more before starting the origin trial. I, I'm wondering, is it not like also possible that a takeaway is like that that the origin trial ran for too long, that the, you know we created this expectation that this is an API that developers could rely on before we actually shipped it to stable? I'm not sure I completely understand what your description of what happened there. Like it, it sounds like we had developers that were relying on this in their applications during the origin trial and we're unhappy to have it change in the origin trial. Is that, is that right? Um, that is correct. Um, I don't know if uh, Chris, who is on this call, or uh, Dan also want to answer some of these questions. But um, um, sorry, what was the question? I, I, I guess the actual question is, is like, What can can you expand on the um, the problems that you had with trying to change the API after it entered origin trial? Basically, yeah, I, I can try and speak a bit to that. Um, it's uh, I mean, given something that involves partners here, it's difficult to say anything too specific. Um, but I would say it could be summarized as the need for the features we were exposing was much higher than the interest of the partners in proposing changes to the API. Um, they, they, they wanted the features much more badly than they cared about how the features were provided to them. Um, so yeah, and as a result, the features were used uh, and the partners do not want to lose access to those features uh, for breaking changes and things like that. I, I guess I would say the origin trial had the effect of um, uh, calcifying the API. Yeah, okay. Because it seems like like I, I'm not on the feature control team, but like my understanding is one of the points of the origin trial process is to prevent calcification of the API. So the fact that you calcified the API during the origin trial process sounds like um, I don't know. Maybe there's some way we could have we could have managed that better. I, I'm not not as criticism of you. Just sort of a question about how well that process is. is um, in cases like this. So I would I would push back a little bit on that characterization. I wouldn't say that we actually calcified. Uh, we have made many breaking changes to the API. Um, uh, and, uh, and some of them actually in, in response to feedback from, from partners, including partners, uh, like kind of reading between the lines sometimes, like it's not that their feedback was directly that this must change, but more that supporting partners in how to use the API uncovered that this was actually quite difficult to use. Um, also on the the high level point about uh, getting into an origin trial too early, uh, certainly I would love to have had more consensus uh, with uh, the broader community on some API shape questions before uh, we launched the origin trial. And some of that um, was hard to come by uh, because while we asked, not everyone was interested in the timeline that we asked. Uh, and they're now interested, and that is um, frustrating at times. Uh, but we also did face an extenuating circumstance that I uh, can't discuss too much on this call, probably because it is partner-specific and sensitive. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, we we worked quickly to meet the needs of partners that um, were unique, I guess, to like pandemic times. Uh, particularly in the RTC space. Um, and an origin trial uh, on the timeline it was given was probably the only way to accomplish that. Yeah, okay, so you, like in that aspect, 
like some of those takeaways you're set that you think might be uh, not once to generalize to other teams, but might be in specific to the the circumstances of this feature. Is that I'm just trying to just try, trying to think about what what I should take away for like the features that I'm working on. So I think I'm not making a comment about the takeaway so much. Like I I agree I agree with the characterization that um, the timing of the origin trial has presented challenges, and those challenges have been borne out in the need to extend the origin trial. Um, uh, I think our circumstances may be pretty unique, uh, such that I'm not too prescriptive about what other folks should do. I think generally I agree with the guidelines of, um, you know, not making people rely on your origin trial to actually launch APIs, uh, not sending an origin trial before you're ready, uh, these sorts of things. Um, and uh, th those are things that I think uh, we should strive to follow in, in, in future uh, trials or future uh, APIs uh, to the extent that circumstances allow. OK. I'm curious, you also sort of mentioned what I think is a common uh, um, problem to people. Sorry, is there another hand? Yes, that, there's yeah. a, All right. Can All you right, come back to that question? Absolutely. Great. Uh, um, yeah, so uh, as, as someone who's, who's built a number of features that gone to origin trial, I have I have, I, have, I, have, I have comments that I can make on, on or, origin trials that I think would be interesting to the discussion. But first I will ask, um, because I think that this, um, this, this building this API shape has, has, has shown some, um, some, some difficulties that, that, that we've had building an, building an API to handle a really um, you know, performance critical uh, tool that uh, getting those, those lessons um, to groups like the TAG and the Folks working on web IDL best practices to um, try to understand the ways in which existing ex existing structures like streams and promises didn't work here, um, and that we, you know we can have guidance on you know like I, th I think I think probably some people in the call may I mean, when 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 the, when the answer you know callbacks were the answer were kind of cringe because I thought we were trying to remove callbacks from the platform, um, but I think like there probably are cases where callbacks are really the right answer, um, and trying to learn from this experience in documenting. The reasons for choosing that design over some of the others that have been um, proposed as kind of the solution for all platform APIs would be a really great thing to pull out of this uh, this design work. Is there um, some particular you would recommend contributing documentation? Uh, to that? So the um, I don't know to what extent the tag has taken a look at this a look at the specification. Um, the tag has a design principles document, uh, which includes things like saying you should use promises, um, and so uh, tr working with the tag uh, to you know, both I assume have them tell you that this design does in fact look good, um, but then take trying to take some of the the lessons from that and put that into the design principles as you know exceptions to when you know using promises is the right answer, um, is is probably probably where where where, where that should go. Uh, yes. Um, okay. Now the now the fun thing on origin trials. Um, <laughs> So I have built, uh, I've done origin trials for web USB, web serial, idle detection. Um, and I think that this API has a very similar uh, challenge that those do as well, which is that uh, this is an API which allows you to implement things that you don't want to ever give up, um, whether that means that it is just a massive performance imp improvement for, your, for your, your site or enables your site to do something it simply couldn't do before. Um, we have a problem, I think, in general with origin trials, where you know when you are a, when you're enabling someone to build something they couldn't build before, it's hard to say that you can give it to them and then take it away. Um, and this is just a problem. And like the origin trial mechanism was des was designed on the assumption that you know you could do an A/B experiment. And when the A/B experiment is your site works or your site doesn't exist or is terrible, then that's not a very useful experiment to run from the like you know. Okay, we can run this for a while and then take it away. Perspective, um, and the the feedback I've gotten from API owners on you know, sort of longer running origin trials and origin trials where the API is shape is changing over time is that um, the API owners do tend do like the idea of an origin trial where the the participants are actively engaging with the with the people running the, tr the trial and are adapting to API changes and that that sort of churn is okay when it comes to running a trial for a long period of time. Um, but uh, I also agree with the idea that, like, when possible, 
uh, we should try to get developers to build things while it's still behind a flag. Um, but understanding that it's very difficult to get somebody to build something um, when there's no guarantee that it's going to actually show up. So I think like the I, I, I have sympathy for the, 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 the struggle that you had in your origin trial. I've had the same, this, the same challenge. I think that, you know, we probably need to, 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 do, to have some more thought about, you know, what we use origin trials for and how we position them for features like this. Um, so I'll let the, the, the folks who think about those things comment. Just to uh, kind of reiterate on, on a previous point here, uh, I, I agree with all the principles laid out there. Um, in this case, I, I really do feel as, as sort of an extenuating circumstance that an origin trial was the only thing that could have solved. Uh, I regrettably can't get into the details of that in this public call, but uh, I would uh, very much invite uh, anyone to challenge me, uh, any Googler to challenge me on that privately, and I will share those details. Um, and I am confident that you will agree. Uh, we have one question in chat. Uh, are those callbacks or events? And if they are callbacks, could they have been made into events? I don't have a clear answer for. I mean, they are callbacks, but uh, I don't. I wasn't involved in that part of the design. Yeah, and it's uh, it's sort of like the promises thing. It's conceivable they could have been events, uh, which are asynchronous. They they have a turn of the event loop to be delivered. Um, like it, it's workable. Uh, the the concern is always about what will the state of the the implementation be by the time that callback is actually invoked. Um, and in particular, I think our error might have possibly been an, an event instead of a callback without causing too many problems. Uh, but the output one was, is a little trickier uh, for the same reasons the promises were tricky. Thank you for that. Uh, Samuel, you have a question? Yes, I'm wondering about like on the whole um, need to change the designs, like our, our process, is there a disconnect between the people who consume the API and us people making the API? Like do we not dog food enough such that we have to have these iteration cycles and then we don't see the ping and then, or they don't see our ping and such? Like for example, are we mostly C++ developers and then JavaScript developers are like not among us and such? Yeah, so uh, sorry, Alex Russell, um, I am one of the API owners that we're talking about. <laughs> um, our process tries to acknowledge that while I think it would be ideal if we all felt our end users pain a little bit more deeply, and, and by the way, I encourage everyone to go make a web page. If you haven't been, done it this quarter, um, go make something with the stuff you built. Um, but uh, to that point, you know, our process tries to cram as much iteration into this surface as possible and to get developer feedback, because it's also easy for us to be captured by the brilliance of our own ideas. Um, you know, We're probably onto something good by the time it, it gets pretty far into this process, but it may not be ideal. And the people who can really um, help us frame that well in that kind of adversarial sense are our end users. They can, they can give us the hard feedback and um, having the API owners kind of like judge whether or not um, you've been honest about that feedback is, is a kind of a role that we try to facilitate Hopefully it's not actually adversarial, um, but we do want folks to uh, be soliciting that feedback of people who sort of aren't in their own heads because it's easy to get go fever and to you know fall in love with your own first idea. Okay, thanks. Um, Jeremy, do you want to take the? Talk uh, the no, that that I, I think the, the 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 latter part of that was covered in the previous question. Can I have a follow up if no one else is uh, queuing up? Um, so how about like uh, polyfilling? Like, I mean, it feels bad if we can't kind of bait and switch and then like, no, give us the API now to get away. But if you say like, no, no, but here is like something you can cut and paste to get the old stuff and can refactor it at your own pace. Like, is that not feasible for this part of example? So maybe the question here is about um, the shape of the API. Was that the rather than its its explicit um, uh, capabilities? Um, just in general about like process again. I'm very hand wavy. Yeah. So there there are some cases where people will come through and they'll say, "Hey, uh, I've got this really low level thing, and um, we'll let somebody else decide what the right API should be on top." They'll be like, "Ah, we'll let a thousand flowers bloom," and people will design their own APIs, and then we'll we'll do that thing. 
Um, and there is a real tension between high level and low level, and I want to acknowledge that and say that you should, you know, I can't tell you which the right one is to start with. Um, but we should probably be trying to make things that people like <laughs> and that they would want to use um, rather than deferring that responsibility entirely. So to the extent that someone is going to be programming to our API, I think we, we do owe it to them and to ourselves to be um, responsive to their feedback about that rather than pushing it off, in part because it comes with, at some cost, right? So there's a download size cost for everything that has to live forever on top of your API, and we want to minimize that. I think that puts us at time. Um, I don't know if this discussion continues on the uh, Slack channels or something like that, but uh, thank you, everybody, for showing up here. And um, hope you have a great day.